Welcome back to the question and answer session with Subliminal and Zero State. Uh, if you missed our conversation about the, the future of Star Citizen combat, how it currently works and in the future, mostly space combat such, uh, it'll be, if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, it'll be right above Subliminal Head. Subliminal's head right there will be a little link. Click that. Go watch that first and come watch this. If you were watching this live, you just saw that. And just rolling right into this, this, this nice section. So this is a section where we, we take questions from the chat. Uh, and we'll do our best to answer as best we can. It could be individual questions. These can be questions for the entire cast. They can be, I try, try to say that they mostly keep on uh, on topic of what we've been talking about, but it, it's entirely up to up the chat. I'll, I'll do some filtering though. So some of this, not all these questions may necessarily be answered. The first question comes from Northern Trooper, who asks, with soft death coming in 318 and ship fighting... Uh, ship fighting transitioning into FPS, will other game loops be involved with PvE slash PvE fighting in space, i.e. hacking, medical gameplay, etc.? So what other elements of the game do you think will be added into this space combat aspect? Subliminal, what do you think? I don't really understand the question. So, like... What other? So oh, beyond just beyond just like FPS, like you know, now that you can destroy a you know soft death ship, and now you can go FPS on that ship. What okay, other I got you. Game loops? Do you think will start getting added into this space combat arena? Sort of, you know, the sort of situation. What about what about rescuing people? Like okay. kind of the opposite of that. Rescuing people um, whose ships have been uh, soft death, um, and and and. Maybe rescuing them, or maybe uh, rescuing them by repairing their ship. I think that'd be pretty cool. Repair you get like a, and... a rescue, a rescue beacon. You show up with your your multi tool with the with the the um, the, the salvaging reverse uh, attachment, and you mm. help bring their ship back to life. That'd be pretty dope. Zero. Um. Yeah, it's. It, it doesn't, I mean, combat is, I don't want to say it's straightforward, but we talked a little bit about it earlier with like, if you're in a ship that has interior and the ship takes damage, like you can run around the ship and repair it from the inside. That'd be cool. Um, and that would affect combat in a big way. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, other than that, yeah. I mean, rescuing people would be great. I think it'd be cool to have NPC missions even where it's like, you know, not just players making medical beacons, but you go oh, there and yeah, actually for sure. res it would a, be a trap. And the NPCs yeah. could be could be in a soft death ship with like nine tails circling around them, you know, and you have to get there in a certain period of time and they're going to destroy the ship. Because we have those combat beacons now where you show up and the guy's like, help me out here, my ship is disabled, but they're all kind of like gamey, right? Mm -hmm. But it'd be kind of cool, like you go down to like, you know, like a place on Daymar or whatever, right? And there's a guy, and he's in, like, a disabled ship. Let's not say soft death, but disabled. Or maybe it's soft death, and he's, like, downed inside of it, you know? Um, and you have to take care of the enemies around that are flying around, and then land and, like, med beat, you know, like, medical him, and, like, get him back up, or, you know, get him, get him up. And then that's, like, the mission completion. And he's like, thanks, man, I appreciate it. And you hear, it'd be fun to hear an NPC talk to you face-to-face -face rather than through, like, your helmet comms. Because mm -hmm. yeah. in the... the Combat beacons right now, the guy's like, you know, all channels, all channels, blah, 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 that guy. Mm -hmm. Who yeah, apparently with... gets into trouble every eight seconds. Uh, <laughs> two voice lines. He has two total yeah. voice lines, possibly. That's so bad. Say. And uh, you, you, you save him, and he just says, thanks, I thought I was a goner, and then that's it. You hear it in your helmet cam. It'd be really cool if you could do that in person, you know, mm -hmm. um, and hear the, hear the actual NPC, like, stand up and be like, whoa, thanks for helping me out, man. See you later. <laughs> You know, that'd be really cool. Um, I, I like the idea of the tow truck gameplay. I'm a, a big fan of tow truck gameplay. Oh, that'd so be things cool, like yeah. the SRV being able to like tow truck. So you have a, a dude who's broke down in the middle of nowhere and you show up and they're like, hey, can you help get me the limping? Or you can you like, I need to get to this location. So you just, you take the SRV, you fly that ship back or you take a, you know, a, a ship with a big enough tractor beam and you fly it as close as you can back to the location. Uh... I could see, because we don't have a lot of stuff, I think bounty hunting probably would be another one of those things that's going to be more like it. As, as Sybil Mental said last the last session, like 
disabling a ship, breaking open, and then like physically capturing and dragging someone back to 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 a location. That's that's almost certainly going to be part of this loop uh, of of space combat as well. So, uh, mm. all right. Um, Northern Trooper asks, "What is the biggest surprise testing? What has been the biggest surprise testing?" Um, Okay, what ha- what has been the biggest surprise testing the will it fit into ships? <laughs> oh, I don't do that man. too much. I'll leave that one to subliminal, I think. Yeah, no, he's talking to me. Yep. Um Nox the Pisces and the Corsair? Oh, yeah. Pisces and the Corsair? Um, I was going to Pis- say, yeah. Yeah, Pisces and the Corsair. You can put a medical Pisces in the Corsair and now you can heal yourself in it. If you could respawn it, that'd be dope. You've turned it into a carrot with guns. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's no, really nice. It's really, uh, it's a tight fit. I don't think you can like walk around it, but you could just have to go outside and take the ladder up. Mm-hmm. That was probably the, the biggest one. I, I think that's probably it. You could put the Merlin in a lot of different uh, ships, like the Valkyrie, MSR, um, and just kind of have like a, a, you know, your own snub toted around. I, I would say the the medical Pisces I did not think was going to fit. Yeah, and we got it to fit without even uh, breaking off the wings. Yeah, I, I I think it was you who I saw do do that. It was like, wow, that actually fits. I had no idea you could fit an entire Pisces inside of a, a Corsair. So, um, all right. First question comes uh, from YouTube from Dan Little asks. This is a pretty 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 easy one. Keyboard and mouse versus Hosas versus Hosam for ship to ship combat zero um so technically speaking hands on stick and mouse with pedals is probably and once you get used to it is probably the most effective mm-hmm. you can move a mouse just super fast right so you can just aim and just tweak that aim with mouse movements most real like the most enjoyable um is probably dual sticks or dual sticks and pedals um, mouse and keyboard is totally serviceable, though. I know some of the literally some of the best pilots in the game that would tear me in half without even losing their shields that play mouse and keyboard. Yeah. So uh, you can be effective with anything. Um, and so in my opinion, I think you just go for whatever, just whatever trips your trigger, whatever feels the best. I, I will I will add on to this, which is another one which wasn't mas- mas- mentioned, but I do think this is heresy that a lot of people think it is. But controllers, these work. They don't just work. I know people who exclusively use these for flying mm-hmm. because they don't have yep. double mm-hmm. sticks. And I know some very is, good pilots that use controllers. Yep. That use these. These are just dual sticks. Is all this is. So the issue is like button mapping because you have to like. Yeah. There's some yep. weird combinations you have people to make do. to work. <laughs> people do but, controllers with pedals pretty often, especially if you have yeah. dual axis pedals, because you can put like, you know, your roll and your forward back on the pedals or whatever you want to do. You know. Yeah. Sub, what's up, what do you think? Yeah, so I don't know about the gamepad thing. I think for a casual player, I just don't feel like I could have the aim with it. But I don't know. I, I've honestly never tried it. But, you know, I may have tried it, but it was a long, long time ago, well before I was confident doing any type of combat. But for just casually cruising around and flying around, I think it's it's pretty, it would be pretty dope. I, w- I would never do it. I spent all this money on getting all this stuff set up. Yeah. I, I'm going to use it, but... Um, but as far as dual sticks, everybody who, who watches uh, me know, I love dual sticks. It's hands down the way to go. I watched a Nubrafire video like that he put out like six years ago or something like that. Um, and he went over all of them and and I, I, I landed on it. And just like Zero said, you might be able to have better aim with the mouse. But the overall immersion and feel is, is the best feeling with dual sticks. Um, I've tried throttle. I have a, a, a Thrustmaster throttle back there. I don't really think it has a place in this game unless, like, maybe you're, you're like, 50-50 on Star Citizen and, a, a like, a DCS or something like that. And, you know. Um, and then as far as pedals, I love my pedals. But I will tell you that it adds another level of frustration in the game to have any more than two peripherals. So uh, maybe look at Joystick Gremlin. Because using the, the the in-game features to, to like resort multiple devices is just a real big pain. Um, I don't I'm not trying to like plug here, but if you do go with the third peripheral, um, my website subliminal.gg slash setup has a link to a USB hub that I found that is made by um 
starts with an S. It's on there. Uh, it's a it's a dope a dope uh, USB hub that doesn't like disconnect and resort the devices all the time. I only have it have it resort the devices when there's like a major update to the game and they they clear out some stuff. Sovereign, yes, yes, Sovereign makes really good stuff and they have a powered USB hub that's great for anybody who has more than three to offload that from your motherboard to um to, to just one USB hub to control it. So I actually yeah. think I have that one and it's what I use and I've never had to, I had that problem all the time where it would switch the, um, the, the inputs when every time there's an update just randomly. And ever since I got that, it's, it's worked fine. Like Another thing too, it. when you go to play an FPS game, like let's say you want to go play call of duty or something like that, that can interfere with the game and you want to disconnect your sticks. Well, it has Push buttons on, on it yeah. to turn off each of the USBs. So I turn them off, and then it's like they're not they're, well. They're not connected. Yeah, it, 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 but it doesn't remove this uh, unsort them. You can turn them back on. They're just right the same, the same, right. same, same location. So yep. This is a bit off topic, but I do think that throttle is more usable if you're a big ship pilot. Like you okay. like to fly ninety jumps. You like to fly. I don't know, maybe constellations, whatever. I think throttle is kind of nice for that because you just want to set your throttle to like twenty five percent and just cruise in this big ship. You know. Um, yeah. that's kind of nice but i mean you could do that with like cruise control but you know uh hard bite that would be um subliminal.gg right setup slash yeah setup. subliminal.gg yeah uh and go to the setup and that'll, that'll that'll help you out uh all right next question comes from northern trooper who asks what type of scenarios are you looking forward to now with pes and soft death i think we answered that a lot a little bit already yeah so we're gonna i'm gonna move through that uh, Monster Avi asks, when do you guys think, or what do you guys anticipate ECM slash E-War becoming something beyond EMP? Zero. Your thoughts on that? Oh, man, I can't wait. Um, <laughs> E-War, I, we have no idea what it looks like. At least I don't. Um, I think it'd be very interesting to be able to target certain modules on ships, um, but big modules. Like, I'm fighting a Cutlass Black in my Sentinel and my co-pilot is in the E-War suite, and he finds a way to, like, make the turret less accurate or make the turret freak out or whatever, you know? I think that'd be really cool to be able to affect things in those ways. I think E-War would be interesting as well for, like, hacking-style gameplay, like being able to, you know, find a way to control a door on a ship or, um, you know, a hangar bay or something like that, you know? Um, but uh, it, it's a difficult thing because right now EMPs are... Very, very basic, you know. Um, it's push a button, wait for it to charge, push the button again, hope you turn your enemy off. That's kind of lame uh, yeah. for the most part. I think it'd be more interesting to see E-War and things like EMP missiles would be very cool um, and uh, a lot more things like that. I think the Legionnaire is going to take, uh, take advantage of a, of a hacking station mm -hmm. of some sort. So, and that's one of the reasons why the Legionnaire is not being talked about by CIG. Cause I don't think they're close with hacking gameplay. <laughs> Sadly, but, they, uh, they, they did that one prototype and uh, even I was like, that's just, this ain't it champ. This ain't yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> Pac-Man uh, as a, as a, as a hacking mini game. <laughs> ah, no, no, yeah. I'm good. And I'm good. I think that's another thing that we talked earlier um, in the previous segment about things that, that you can do in a ship to affect the outside yeah. experience of the ship. And I think that's a big one, you know, um, the idea of like hacking gameplay or just engineering gameplay, you know, kind of mixing in with that E-War gameplay, that kind of stuff. Um, it adds another layer of depth to the indoors of a multi-crew ship that allows you to affect the outside, which is really cool. Subliminal, your thoughts. What about like um, being able to search for someone, like um, hmm. fine tuning like a, a, a beam of a, a search beam. Like, I think this guy's over here and finding, finding out where enemies could be that might be hidden. that might be outside of the, the scanning range because you focused a beam in some way. That'd be pretty cool. Okay. Especially in some like, like a bigger ship to have somebody like dedicated to something like that. I think that'd be pretty cool. But of course, everything zero said, he said, all, he says it all. He says uh, it all. <laughs> uh, all right. Next question comes from stop and sniffer who asks, uh, how much of an impact do you think rebalancing detection range would have a have on ship combat? Subliminal. What do you think? Hmm, I would want to ask them, like, what 
what do they want to change? What's their problem with it now? Um, I don't, I don't really have. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, they're basically talking about stealth. Yeah. I really liked when we had the stealth meta in. I liked that I could equip my ship. I haven't even thought about this in a while. It's been so long. That yeah. I could equip my ship in a way, especially like an arrow. Uh, Burks uh, used my arrow build I was talking about. It. I was like, you got to put in a slipstream on there. And he found out that there was like, he could get to a certain distance where he couldn't have a missile thrown at him because they couldn't see where he was. Yeah. And I thought I thought that that was really cool. And um, sure, at the at that time there wasn't really a trade off for going with that, other than I think maybe like a distortion reboot times or something like that. Um, so it might have been a little bit op, but I would like to see that that aspect. Um, I mean, I'm I I don't know how often you guys watch my videos, but if you notice, I'm not doing any more loadout guides on videos and buyers yeah. guides because they kind of baselined everything, and I don't yeah. really see the reason to do it. It was fun back then when I could tell someone like, "Hey, like, don't go with that JS four hundred or whatever, or JS three hundred. Go with the slipstream instead and lower your detection range." The uh, Caltuade um, would would actually be able to have this detection range slow down so much that you could technically have like a couple hundred meters where you could shoot somebody with your bullets and they wouldn't be able to see where you're at. <laughs> it was pretty dope, man. I'm sad to see that go. I really it's want kind of, stealth gameplay uh, to come back. There's some ground vehicles that are like that, actually now mm, um yeah. some of the the tumbrils i think they have like a 12 or 1400 meter range um is it uh, the cyclone mt oh yeah the other ones well, the two of them mt and the MT, the tr tr uh, yeah the where they can shoot at yeah. you but you can't target them because you can't target them from outside of like you know two or three hundred meters or whatever it is so i think that's pretty interesting ursa is like that you have to be really close to target it um uh, that's, and it makes it frustrating because it's Kind of a simple it needs to be tweaked right but if you could apply that to ships that'd be really cool yeah the saber i mean having it's what is it 20 or 25 percent uh em reduction em and ir reduction would be very cool yeah what do, what do you think um well, zero state uh, how, how much impact do you think rebalancing radar detection ranges would have on ship combat yeah i think i'll echo a little bit what subliminal said too a component choice is something that Star Citizen has always kind of lacked a little bit. Like, it it didn't seem to matter that much about component choice. Sometimes, you know, it depends on the component. It, it kind of came and went. Right now, it's matter. it matters less than maybe it ever has. Um, or at least since, like, what is it, 314 14. or 315? Whatever they baselined it all. Um, whereas, like, it, people ask me, like, what's the best, you know, laser repeater? I'm using attritions on my band, and they're like, well, how do you use the attritions? I'm like, because they make a cool sound. And, like, <laughs> you know, it doesn't, there's no other reason to, it doesn't matter, you know? Um, and it's always kind of, it'd be kind of cool to tell that person like, well, I use attritions because the more you fire them, the more they heat up and the more damage they do, but they have a shorter range than the Panthers do. But if I were to switch to like NDBs, you know, they would do a different type of damage and they would have their own uses and it would create this kind of dynamic, uh, conversation you could have, um, around different types. Also, it'd be like, you come across a guy who's got a bunch of, you, you hear his attrition lasers and you go, oh, I know the, I know the, you know, how those weapons work. So I know how to fight him, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, which would be really cool and add a lot to. So, um, yeah, I think I, I would like to see component choice starting to come back. And I think as as they kind of work out, you know, maybe some of the armor things, they work out, you know, some of the you know some of those baselines, they can start to say, okay, this goes here, and this goes here, and this goes here, and this goes here, and you know, kind of start to work that out. But you have shield choice, uh, power plant choice, uh, cooler choice, um, you know, oh. thrusters someday, quantum drive choice mattering a little bit more um i think that'd be yeah component choices affecting the game space that you play in and how you play it and how others view you playing it and how they react to you playing it just adds so much depth i'm all about adding depth <laughs> it is pretty crazy that out of the i think the entire time i play i played the game and i could be wrong on this maybe it was different when i first started there's never been a reason to change your cooler from the stock unless you had like a drake ship uh, some Drake ships have like D class components that just don't have yeah. enough cooling. But for the most part, if you have enough cooling, it's it it doesn't matter what you do with the ship, it's gonna be fine. There are um, some coolers that had or have or had a little bit higher distortion resistance. Oh, so there yeah, was right, kind of a yeah. reason. And then a long time ago, you, you would use competition coolers in your combat ships mm -hmm. because they would when your weapons over when weapons used to overheat. That was how they were yeah. like you know. Before um, they would capacitors. cycle faster. Yeah. yeah, they would cycle faster. But um, yeah, now it doesn't seem to matter very much. Aside from maybe distortion stuff. But All right. 
Uh, next question comes from Steve the Dancer, who asks, since CIG has now put a, a damage reduction to ballistics on certain ships, where do ballistics stand now? We already <laughs> covered that. But it's, we did a little bit, but I, the short I, version is kind of where they were before. There's not enough ammo for the yeah. most part. Um, it, yeah. yeah, pretty much that. <laughs> not a lot of ch not a lot changed except for because of that. So now it's just kind of why was this implemented kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. yeah. So um, next question comes from Northern Trooper, who asks, with distortions working now and the ship shut down timer at five minutes, what would you think are the limitations uh, what do you think are the limitations until resource management comes online against large slash capital ships? Like what, what is protecting a large capital ship from just being uh, overwhelmed by, uh, by mm. distortions and just, just being lamoud, you know, GG. I would hope two things. I would hope a robust amount of distortion HP on critical components. Mm-hmm. And a, well, and someday in the future, the ability to, inside the ship, have an engineer that can heal it faster, like make it, you know, uh, like work on it to like, oh, this, this power plant is like halfway distorted or whatever. And I have something I can do to like reduce that. But, um, and then distortion recovery. So like, let's say that this, the distortion HP of a power plant in an Idris is like, you know, 16,000 or whatever. Um, and if it, you know, they distort it till it hits like, you know, three or 4,000 and then it gets a chance to recover. And so it recovers, you know, back down kind of quickly. Um, I think that you have to kind of balance that with capital ships. It would take a huge amount of distortion damage, in my opinion, to truly distort and shut down a ship like an Idris or something. Okay. So what do you, what's your, what's your thoughts on, on um, how to, how to counter distortions for larger ships? Maybe maybe you shouldn't really be able to do it um, okay. for some of the bigger ships. Does that make sense? I yeah. can see that. Distortion um, where like the, the modules are far enough away from the surface of the ship that the distortion exactly. just can't reach into them. Could be. I think that's literally the way it works. It's, it, it has worked in some patches. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know that it, that it should be. I think it's kind of unrealistic that I could you know, slap some weapons on like a Banu Defender and shut down a capital ship. Just shut it down. For five minutes, you know. Um, I'm going to let my dogs out real quick while you ask the next question. I can still hear sure. you, though. Okay. Uh, all right. We'll go with the uh, next YouTube question, which is, how far are you guys willing to push your gaming setup slash sim pit for Star Citizen in the future? Zero, start with that. Oh, man. Uh, you know, I really like being able to use my PC for a lot of things, and it's just me. So I don't think I ever want my P my main my gaming PC to be like a sim pit. Personally speaking, I like mounts that you can remove. Um, you know, things that make it modular. If I want to change something about my setup, I can change that. I don't per personally. I, I'm not a big sim pit guy because once you build a sim pit and you have some like little fundamental change you want to make, I don't want to have to rip the whole thing apart to make this change. You know. Um, so for me, I like modularity. I like you know kind of what I, where I'm at. Um, I have a dream someday to own a Simpit Technologies Icarus 180 Avenger, uh, which is a gigantic, like, Vanta Black style screen. It's not Vanta Black, but it's like this special screen thing, and you get these short throw projectors and like warping software, and it creates a 180 degree like curve around you. And playing a game like Star Citizen on that would be amazing. But that's just a dream. That's not really a goal. It's a <laughs> How far are you willing to push your, your sim pit? I'm willing to go pretty far. Uh, the limitations I have right now is the room that I'm in is too small. Um, and I can't, I need my desk to, to work, make videos. So I can't, mm -hmm. I can't do much more to this currently. Cause, honestly, because when I am playing an FPS game or I am just sitting at the desk, I need to take the sticks off and, and put them off to the side. But, um, in the event that I get a house and I can have a room dedicated to just the live streaming aspect of it, maybe, um, then that, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, it'll be, it'll be dope. I want to, it'll be on TikTok, you know, Go viral. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm thinking more with zero on this one in that, that I have, I play, I play other games. I do other things with my computer, you know, uh, and if 2020 taught me anything, 
is I got to be able to be flexible when it comes to, to, to working in environments. So having a, a nice modular setup and not really doing a sim pit, I'd love the full on, like, like full on VR sim pit with like the, you know, that, that track, that running track thing where like, you can mm. like sit up there and you do, you can actually run and you can run on a treadmill. It's like an Omni, Omni mill or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would be my, my ultimate sim pit thing, but that's, that's still, no, not going to, but, but almost certainly uh, the most, most I'm going to really go willing to go for is VR setup such. I have it, but I need to upgrade it. Cause I have like an OG, a rift, like the first rift, like the first consumer great rifts. So I need to get to the, the newer ones that come out. Uh, all right. Next question comes from monster Abby who asks on pylon slash external hard points. Do you think they will still be implementing them? Will you be able to upsize the hard points in space? Lack of at, uh, lack of atmos slash weight restrictions. So on things like external pylons, do you think they'll still be implementing uh, ha- having pylons be like swap out for other like tanks or other uh, like, like fuel tanks or rocket pods or bombs or or other weapons? Do you think still think they're going to happen have stuff like that? Start with you, simple on this. I don't know. I feel like they wouldn't. Just allow that to happen on any ship. It would have to be something that was thought out from the from the get go, um, kind of like the galaxy where you could swap out the different modules. Mm-hmm. Um, but that would be you wouldn't be able to do it in space. Yeah, I don't know. I don't see that really going that route. But yeah, don't tell them. It's just gonna <laughs> just add add another couple of years onto the development. Because <laughs> sounds like something Chris Roberts would say yes to. Yeah. What do you think, Zero? Personally, I mean, I'm not sure of this, but I. Th- think at this point we are going to get whatever squadron 42 gets and partially we don't know what squadron 42 gets but we have to ask ourselves does squadron 42 require a system where you can swap out pylons for like fuel tanks Mm -hmm. probably not um but maybe you know um so i think personally i i i kind of doubt it um but i think it'd be very cool if especially if some ships like you know harbingers or maybe the gladiator we talked about earlier could fit like size three bombs instead of torpedoes and be multi-role you know um or like a variant system you know where there's like a gladiator that's a bomber variant versus a torpedo variant you know but or you could basically change the variant by swapping out x mod like you said with oh the gladiator. yeah yeah modularity i with the galaxy's creation with its announcement and what we know about it we know that modules have to be a thing, right, at mm-hmm. some point. And so, you know, they could just take it, you know, the Galaxy has modules. Well, okay, so this this other ship has modules. Well, now we've kind of opened up this technology, this module swapping thing that we can, you know, the Cutlass can have some modules and the Gladiator can have some modules and the A2 can have some modules or whatever, right? Possibilities open up. I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm with you mostly on that, uh, especially with the whole whatever squadron has is what we're going to see. Uh, I could see having things like reef, like fuel tanks and some options for the pylon system only because that makes for more engaging and deep gameplay for like a single player. You want to do a mission. It's, it's the old, the, the, the old, um, uh, pistols only, or like those, those challenge runs, uh, uh, what's his name from, um, from Elden ring. Let me solo her. The guy who did it like naked. Uh, he, he apparently like he beat the entire game naked uh, with a character without any armor uh, and like just a stick or something like that and a bucket yes. on his head. So th- those sorts of things make make the game more replayable and interesting. Be like, ah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to play Squadron 42, but instead of having missiles, I'm going to replace it all with with uh, with fuel so I can just fly forever and, and re- run people down the kind of thing. So I had a little bit of fun running uh, Siege of Horrors and Knife Only. Yes. I, I completed one, uh, one run, and I died midway through the through the second run. But it was pretty fun. On the topic of uh, pylons, like missile pylons, so correct me if I'm wrong here. If I recall, CIG discovered that they could make bombs because somebody was dropping missiles mm-hmm. and realized, oh, we could just <laughs> make bombs that are missiles, but we can just drop them. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's how they made bombs. So it's like, I guess it's probably pretty, it would be pretty easy, I think, to like 
instead of a size three missile on the wings of the Gladius, you'd have a little size one bomb that fits on that same pylon as a size mm. three missile might. Yeah. That's the only reason why you couldn't do that, you know, and just when you go to drop it, the only issue then would be injecting the bombing HUD instead yeah. of the missile HUD, which then maybe you could get around it by saying, well, it's not a, it's not a dedicated bombing craft, so you, you have to drop bombs blind. Okay, yeah. sure, whatever, you know. Yeah, but it also leads to other, other things where you, if you, especially with the whole, like, upgrade slot things where you, you the, the HUD becomes an actual upgrade part, port part where you can have the missile mode, but you also then have to swap out the missile mode for the, the bombing yeah, mode. Yeah, it could be, a, that could be a blade you slide in there, yeah. right? the blade mm -hmm. stuff, yeah. Yeah. All right, next question comes from Northern Trooper who asks, will CIG ever find the balance for all ships in game uh, or will each class have it some meta behind it? And will CIG be chasing that loose end until the end of time? Yeah, I'm gonna... I don't think there's any way we're going to have as many ships as we have right now and have them all kind of be balanced. No. There's going to be yeah. uh, ships that are going to be specifically really good at X, but not good at X. Um, and there might be some jack of all trades, but there'll be a master of none. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. You know, you know what's yeah. weird? Yeah. The Colorless Black has always been that, almost always. It's almost yeah. never been the best at anything, which is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> that that um, ship is, as as the pilot used to say, that ship is a bastard. I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. that ship's a bastard. It does everything you want to do just good enough that you're like, this is a really good <laughs> ship. And yeah. then it falls on its face whenever you really want to push it towards that. It's like, nope, it's not a yeah. good fighter. It's not a good cargo hauler. It's it's not good anything, but it's just good enough that you're not going to get steamrolled if you use it right. Yeah. So I think on that on that topic, too, it's it's easy to strive for like a perfectly balanced game. But I got to be honest, every time you have a perfectly balanced game, at least every perfectly ga balanced game or close to it that I've played, when there's absolutely no meta, when it feels yeah. like it doesn't matter whether you bring an arrow or a gladius or mm -hmm. a talon or a cutlass or a banu or a buccaneer or, or a hawk, when it doesn't matter what you bring, it doesn't matter that you have all them. You know, it doesn't matter that there are any different ships aside from like, oh, I like the way my hawk looks. That's, you know, that's a silly reason to have it, you know, comparatively to, well, the hawk does this really well. And so that's why I'm bringing it, you know. Um, so I think ships like the Ares ships, the Inferno, the Ion, um, ships that are very unique are incredibly important to the ecosystem, the ship ecosystem and the balance ecosystem of Star Citizen, because there's nothing, there's no other ship that does quite what an Inferno does. And there's no other ship that does quite what a Buccaneer does, you know, uh, the way that it does it. And there's no other ship that does quite what a Sentinel does at the moment. Um, and I love that. I love that about Star Citizen, that it's like, oh, this guy's flying an X ship, you know, whatever the ship is. So I have to watch out for, you know, a, B, and C, you know, um, and, I, and I love that. And I don't think that should ever go away. Um, and naturally in that system, you're going to have ships that in, in, in situations where you're like, okay, this ship is crazy, crazy good. And there's a meta for this situation, you know, and it's just, it's never going to go away. And if it did go away, I think that would create a less exciting experience as, as a whole. I agree. And we're also going to see a situation where CIG is just going to change the meta up just because, because that keeps things interesting. Like, you know, Oh, well, you know, and, and I, I will say this in a perfect world, if you are good at flying the ship you are, you own, the only things that will matter are like in terms of meta will be so vanishingly small that it'll be completely based off of skill. That's the perfect idea. I've, I've known people back in the arena commander days who would take the intentionally take the worst ships that you could possibly fly and win matches of arena commander with them. And just make people scratch their heads like, how did you beat me in an Aurora or in, in the, the, the greased up pig that was the Cutlass that literally would like handle worse than a Connie does uh, <laughs> currently. And th those people got hired by CIG to do balance. So hopefully they, they are the folks that they kind of take those lessons and, and move forward on that. But I agree with that, that you, you can't ever balance. How can you balance a combat if a combat ship of like an Orion with... Mm -hmm with an idris it's just they, 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 just, they don't even uh, they're both capital ships but they, they don't even belong in the same category of combat because they're just not the same so yeah but every ship having its place will matter a lot too yeah for sure uh crystal king asks how easy slash hard would it be for cig to combine the ballistics mitigation uh given to large ships with the 
quote unquote armor system that came in with salvage. Isn't it the same thing? Um, there is a ballistic well, it was one change. and then the other kind of. So like the ballistic shield changes happened. And then to kind of band-aid the problems that it brought up, they put on this damage reduction thing. I think the whole conversation is kind of, to me, the whole conversation just feels weird until we understand what armor is going to be. Like, yeah. is armor going to be damage reduction based on ship class, like ship size, and then against weapon size or like caliber? And then is it going to be like cannons are more effective against armor because they're bigger calibers? Like, we don't know, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and until we kind of know some of those things, it's very hard to speculate what would work well in different situations, you know? Um, to, to me, it's just very difficult. Yeah, I... I, I... I don't understand the question, so I, I'm, I'm going with that. <laughs> so, do you have anything to add? No, I'm good. Okay. All right, let's pull up the um, next question comes from Dan Little, who asks, how much does adding head tracking to any hand control setup improve the flight experience, if any? So, oh. do you have head tracking? I have Toby. Love it. Yeah. I don't have to have a thing on my head. I've heard... Um, What's the what's up track IR? Uh, the only people that I know who have both like Moist Noodle, he said he liked track IR better, but because it was like more responsible or more responsive. Mm -hmm. But um, I have Toby, and I couldn't imagine it being any. I, I don't need it to be any more responsive than it is, and it's just it's great. I really like it. I've been racing for the past couple days uh, with the new races in three eighteen, and it's nice to be able to look into your turns. Um, one of the best things that I, I didn't re I, I kind of forgot that was a feature is you can have an option to bind target what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So I can look to the left. I can see a, a target there. And when I flick up on my hat switch, it targets what I'm looking at. Well, my bindings kind of got reset with 318 in the PTU and I didn't have that anymore. And I was wondering like, why can't I target this guy? I'm looking at him. And I'm like, Oh, I, I didn't have that set. You kind of forget about it, but it's it's much more immersive. And and with that aspect of it, of being able to target what you're looking at, it might give you a tactical advantage. Oh, for sure. Uh, but it's it's great. I love it. Yeah. Um. The like the so I've had I used to use Track IR. Um. And I use Toby now, but Track IR is the most responsive head tracking system you can have, and you can get wireless options. That being said. I don't think that the head tracking of the Toby is less responsive enough to matter in, in, in game, in typical gameplay, um, for, at least for me. And if you add on to that, the ability to, okay, I'm looking at, at the left, like, you know, the upper left part of my screen, there's an enemy there and that's what selects the target. You can actually see their little Chevron get brighter because they're selected. And then there's a keybind called lock selected target. And so your gaze where you're looking is selecting the target and then you click lock selected target and it locks what you're looking at. And this works in reverse cam. You can literally hold the keybind to look behind you in your ship and target people who are chasing you and target specific people who are chasing you because you're selecting that target. It's incredibly useful. It's, it's unbelievably immersive. And I would never want to go back um, from having the eye tracking. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I, I had it. It's good. I didn't get, I have to get used to it is the issue is just kind of like, it's like, it's like sticks or pedals or any other kind of new control method. It takes a bit to get used to it, but yeah, it does completely change how you play the game and it becomes more immersive. It's kind of like twin sticks. It's like, it feels weird at first, but you know, a month after you've started playing on it or, you know, a couple sessions after you start to get the handle of it and then it becomes almost natural and you, you have such a much better experience with it overall. So, uh, all right. Next question comes from the Astro Chronicles, who asks, would you go for sushi and sake on Microtech, taco and a beer on uh, Lorville, steak and wine at Orison, or tequila and uh, gherkins at Grimhex? I'm sorry. I didn't hear anything after sushi. I'm, I'm down. You're down? Sushi? Yeah, <laughs> sushi, sushi and sake? I'm, I'm good. Yeah. I'm inclined to say tacos and beer, but that means I have to go to Lorville. So there might be <laughs> sand in my tacos. Well... <laughs> You also got to remember that the best tacos come out of the like the the car the 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 back of a of a van that looks like it was a, it's just a walking health hazard. 
Those are like yeah, that and you have to go. You have to add in the option for turtle soup at uh, Area 18. At Area 18, yeah, because yeah, they have the turtles at the vendors there now. Um, yeah, probably taco. As long as the tacos were not found in a trash can or like a garbage <laughs> bag, then yeah, tacos and beer. Yeah, I'm gonna agree with that one too. Uh, I, I'm not. Lorville tacos are former employees. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Uh, all right. Uh, Dan Little asks, question for all and a bit off topic. What is your favorite or what is your first ship, your favorite ship and your dream slash holy grail ship? Ask that again. So what is your what is your what was your first ship? What is your favorite ship? And what is your dream ship? The my ship first like ship the was the Aurora MR. Mm-hmm. Uh, my favorite ship right now is the Banu Defender. And um, my dream ship would be a Sabre that is... Functional. <laughs> where, it where, it, where it should be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say my first ship was the 315P. That's a long story, but I'm just an, I'm, I'm an idiot. Otherwise, it would have been an MR. <laughs> uh, none of the packages obviously said Alpha Access, and the first one I saw that said that, that was was the 315P, so I was just like, I'm just going to buy that. Uh, my current ship is the, the Cutlass Redeemer. Black. Oh, never mind. No, not the Redeemer. <laughs> I hate that <laughs> ship. Um, and my dream ship would be uh, the, the, the Banu Merchantman. So just that's the ship I'm waiting for. My first Zero. pledge, my first ship was 325A. Oh. Um, I love the look of that thing. I always have, even even before and after the rework. It just looked awesome. Um, my favorite ship is a tough one right now. My favorite ship, a small ship, if it's a small ship, would be the Hawk. But otherwise, honestly, I love the Constellation. Like, I love the look of it. I love that it, you know, I just love it. Love the Constellation. Dream ship? Man, that's a tough one. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the it, dream it doesn't have to be... be a ship that actually exists in the game. If it's a ship that you want to see in the future. <laughs> My dream ship is probably like, well, probably a Reliant, the Reliant series being better, just being better. Uh, I, I've always loved the Reliance. They remind me of the B-Wing a lot. I love that they're unique. There's nothing like them. So yeah, probably the Reliance being like kind of what they should be. Okay. All right. Next question comes from Steve B. Dancer, and I'll be right back after I say this. Uh, start with you, Subliminal. How do you feel where the Ares Inferno stands with ballistic damage reduction in large ships? How do you think the Inferno stands? And then move over to zero. I, I think it's it's that the whole running out of ammo thing is the huge part. That's the that's the kicker. I don't I don't think we like to run out of ammo so quickly have to go back and rearm for it um and and if you are going to keep it that way the only way you can make it justifiable to even use is to have it be op damage wise anyway um yeah it's just it's not in a good place um the only thing i can see someone using it for is to help take out an idris uh, an idris like a capital ship but you can get into a connie you could get into uh 600i it's a little bit fragile um the Corsair now can take out a hammerhead better than the Ion or the Inferno. Uh, yeah, hands down. I feel awful about the Ion. That thing, because especially with like ballistic, the ballistic pass through thing on shields, like, man, what did that do to the Ion? You know, the Ion was already worse at killing big ships than the Inferno uh, in general. Mm-hmm. Unless you're at like Xeno threat, right? Where, where ammo is a concern. But if you're trying to kill one or two big ships, especially with players in them, you're taking an Inferno if you have one versus the Ion. And it's with Ballistic Pass-Through, now you're do- dealing direct damage to the hull the entire time, almost, full, you know, uh, except the damage reduction thing they added. But that makes the Ion even worse because now it's like, now you got to eat through the shields in the Ion and it just you're, you're just behind the entire time with the Ion. But anyway, um, the damage reduction thing makes it interesting because it... It feels like the Inferno, any of those 80XB weapons, like 84B, 85B, 87B, um, they're just in such a weird place. Like, they have enough ammo to make them usable, <laughs> but they're the only guns that have enough ammo to make them usable. All the other ballistics 
just don't have enough ammo to make them usable, to make them viable in 90% of your engagements. And so it just create it, it throws all of the ballistics, just ballistics in general into this weird place. You know, the more that the more layers of this weirdness they put on them without touching ammo counts, you know, um, or, you know, ammo with overheat and all the other things we talked about earlier. Hmm. Right, anonymous uh, bystander says we need 10 times more ammo i got news for you anonymous bystander we used to have 10 times more ammo we did <laughs> yes i i mean i get the reason why they, they, they reduced it because they want to have it so that players can like physically reload ammo so that if you have a ship that's like a multi-crew ship that having the ability to swap out or add ammo in mid mid game like that that sort of aspect will then boost the, the usability of those larger ships. And they want to kind of move people away from light fighters towards more multi-crew ships. But as always cart before the horse, it's like, cool. Then give us that, that feature. Do you don't have the feature yet? Let's have all this ammo <laughs> so we can actually use the gun. But you know, uh, all right. Monster Abby asks, speaking of trading issues, do you think them saying that they intend to put the whole C in game is indicating quanta? just hauling missions or some general improvement overall. Uh, I mean, we are at a stage, uh, I'll just start with this, where quantum has to be in the game sooner rather than later. Because it's not, quantum is, is, is the, after PES and server meshing, quantum is the game. Almost everything is touched by it. The mission system will be run by it. The, the trading and like the, the price values of not just all of commodities, but your, your mining materials, even the ships and components themselves will be priced based off the quantum system. So uh, an Aurora in Stanton is going to be different from an Aurora in Pyro, just from in cost alone, let alone mm -hmm. maintenance or anything else. So all of these systems, which they're trying to implement, which they've started to implement, need to be fleshed out if they want to go further beyond this. So uh, almost certainly we're going to have to have something this year. Uh, at least I hope. What do you think? I think it's right? interesting. Uh, in, I've played a lot of Elite Dangerous. Those of you who played Elite Dangerous know the mm. background sim. And if you yeah. don't know the background sim, then uh, Frontier did a terrible job explaining to you what the background sim is and how in-depth it is. The background sim, or BGS in Elite Dangerous, is one of the most in-depth game systems that I've ever had the pleasure of interacting with in any game ever. Um, to say that there's no depth in Elite Dangerous means you didn't experience it. And that's probably on Frontier for not explaining it to you or explaining to you how you can in interact with the background sim. Quanta to me feels like it's going, it should be um, a version of the background sim because in Elite Dangerous, the background sim dictates what you can, like what you can sell for profit, what you can buy for profit, things that are available, things that aren't available, things that are legal, things that aren't illegal in systems. Um, you can actually push a back, a faction to take over a system to make certain things like slavery or, or trading certain types of slaves in the game or trading certain weapons, different things like that. You can make things illegal or legal in a system by, you know, uh, cha by changing who's in power with this background sim. It's, it's absolutely uh, in, an incredible system. So if Quanta even comes close to what the background sim is and does it in a more tangible, like I can affect the universe around me kind of way, then I think it'll be amazing. Um, I think it'll be really cool. What do you think, Sibyl? Yeah. Do you think we're going to see uh, more of this added this year? It kind of has to be, man, at this point. You know, it's been so long. I love hearing Tony Z talk. Um, I, I think, I'm hoping that when, at least by the end of the year, maybe when 4.0 comes out, maybe they'll have at least the basic commodities running off of it. Um, mm. I don't know about altering the prices of components and, and ships right now, if they're going to focus on something like that. Um, I'm also excited about, like, rep and stuff. Um, and the what's the i don't know what they call it the dynamic events that happen on their own mm -hmm. um the, the, the dynamic uh event system similar to it's, it runs on quantum same concept though. yeah yeah so like a, a station gets attacked so they need medical supplies so the price of medical supplies uh goes up and you, you know you can make you can make more profit so yeah all that that's all really really dope i can't wait for there to be um that to just happen organically just every day. You know what I mean? Uh, a nine tails lockdown could just happen like on its own, mm -hmm. maybe even started by something players did. Maybe the players were the one that attacked the station and, and did it. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited about that. That yeah. 
I've dynamic got events problems. being dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> um, it brings asked... up a point. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. It brings up a small point about in video games that you play, you go to like a shop and it's like, well, you can buy this and you can buy this and you can buy this, but you, we don't know you well enough to sell you this, 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 and this. You're, you're not ready yet. And you have to do more missions for them. Um, a good game, Grim Dawn actually does this. It's a, Grim Dawn is a little bit like a Diablo kind of clone. Um, and in, in Grim Dawn, there are very powerful things that you can get by becoming honored, uh, respected, honored, and then like revered with a faction. So you have to like work for that faction, do bounties, do missions and stuff like that. Um, and you get there and it's like, you are now revered with this faction. You can buy this awesome six set of armor from that faction that does, that, that does certain things really well. Um, games that have that give you something to work for. They give you something to strive, like strive towards, and they give you enjoyment when you make it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so even like a good example might be like Grim Hex, right? Like you have to do some missions for Wallace to be able to buy certain, you know, weapons or grenade, you know, whatever it might be at Grim Hex to be able to shop there in certain mm -hmm. ways. You know, you have to, you know, missions for, uh, you know, Vaughn to be able to buy a certain ship, maybe at Grim Hex or some other place like that. You know, um, working for the area to be able to, to live there is a, is a very cool thing. Yeah. And, and I'm doing I, I, racing now. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I'm doing racing now and I was looking at the list and all I'm doing is unlocking more and more tracks. Yeah. How dope would it be if I got to the end and I got to get some special race suit that I could run around with and the only way I could get it was because I did that thing. Like yeah. somebody could look at me and say that guy got all gold or all platinum on all eight racetracks. That that's pretty dope. One of my So he's got a he's got a sick looking razor that he flies around, you know, or whatever. Yeah. That'd be cool. Like one of my favorite things in the game, I would say out of all the things that I own, my um, Vandal helmet is like my favorite thing. I can care less about the gold armor or the monocle, right? That Vandal helmet, well, okay, there were some people that stood in the conga line, okay? Yeah. But I, I, I am <laughs> yeah. not all that great at PvP, okay? I'm, I'm an average PvP pilot. And... I grinded for like two days at Grim Hex, honorably scrimmaging people until I got my 50 kills. And I, that's like, I, I can't believe after that, after Morphala just made his video on how like things just don't really seem to matter because if it doesn't matter that you grinded bunker missions so you could buy an 890, anytime somebody sees it, they're going to be like, that guy bought that 890. Yeah. And and but that Vandal helmet, for the most part, <laughs> the person probably at least just grinded out those 50 kills and, and participated in it. I, I just I love that. Yeah. I um I, it's the same with me. I have my CDF armor that I got from 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 Xenothreat. Like that I mm. I always I, I I'm always hesitant to wear it, but whenever Xenothreat comes around or or uh, Siege of Orison, I bust it out. Why? It's it is a sign that I've actually participated. It's, it's something that I could walk around and people being like, oh, this it, those who know like, no, th that means that I was a, you know, spent a lot of time fighting Xeno threat. Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, I think it's cool that people when people say, like, what's your favorite object in Star Citizen? If even people that are like concierge in Star Citizen, you know, they have that gold set of armor. They yeah. never say that because no, it's. Never. It's not an accomplishment. I mean, it's like if people see it as maybe a certain type of accomplishment. Oh, you back the game. And that's cool. Like, yeah, that's nice. You want to make see the game be made and you back the game. That's great. But it's very cool to see that people's favorite things are often tied to things they did in game rather than things that they did out of game. And I think uh, I think CIG should continue to lean into that, mm -hmm. you know, rewards for being involved in certain things or going certain places or completing certain tasks would be really cool. I, mean, I would I've, say I, I'm more ashamed of my gold armor yeah. <laughs> than I am <laughs> proud of. A reminder of. of how much money you've spent on this game. <laughs> yeah, don't let my wife know what that, what that means. Like, we're um, all going to meet, we're all going to meet in the Million Mile High Club after this. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was going to say the, um, oh, what, it was in my my brain that I just left it. Okay, I'm sorry. I, it's, I threw you you're off. good. <laughs> um, Oh, I, I was going to say that this is this is a it's a preaching to the choir. I I I, I unapologetically said 
that I do not think they should give us free stuff on the website for for lo- for like signing up on the web or for like like logging on the website. Like mm-hmm. the the Luminalia stuff should all be earned in game. You should all be able to, even if it's just going to a console and like saying I want this for free. I mean, I feel- find a find one of the presents laying around. Just one. Just yeah. pick it up. Mm-hmm. A present enters your inventory on this day. You get the gift. Yeah. You know. I was barely around for that entire event. Got everything. Yeah. Because yeah. you didn't have to even sign up for the, you didn't have to even log into the game. You can just. And then not only that, but like I missed like three days in a row and I'm like, oh no, I missed some of the items. And I went in and found out I could just get them all. Yeah. yeah. Like the, the, well, it was retroactive. Here's a, here's a, an idea for next year. Okay. Um, I, this won't make it to CIG, but nope. we're going to think, pretend like it will. Yeah. Uh, so each day, the presents you find in game, relate to that day's gift on the final day you can find all 12 unique gifts in game like you pick up a present and it says this is gift number one or whatever yeah and then this is gift number two and then you can collect them all it, like on the final day but it still has you in the game doing things to get the gifts yeah you could even do that with like because i think they they do the 12 days of luminalia and then they have they had like two weeks or three weeks where mm-hmm. you could still kind of go back and do it you can still do that just have them all be available after that and if you got all 12 every day then you get a special 13th gift that's like uh that you you get automatically for being like a present hunter or something like that so yeah um but yeah uh all right let's move on to the next question which is uh do you think this is the year for a large amount of people to discover star citizen zero do I think this is the year for them to discover it? Um, it's not a bad year for them to discover it. I think a lot of things make more sense in the game when it's working. Like, I crashed my ship, and I can go back, and my ship is still still there. That kind of stuff is very cool. Um, for Star Citizen to kind of take a big step towards the game it wants to be, um, you know, I think that's... I think that's very, very cool for new players. So I'll say if 3.18 comes out before the end of 2023, <laughs> uh, then 2023 could be a very... And, and, it's, and it's relatively stable. If it comes out and it's relatively stable um, and it, it gives a good experience, a decent experience for new players, then I think, yeah, 2023 is a great year to discover Star Citizen for $45. Yes. Yes. <laughs> not, not for 115 Subliminal, what do you think? Do you think we'll see more uh, this the year that this that Star Citizen gets more mass appeal? The you know starts winning over more people. It's not going to happen until 4.0. 4.0. God willing, it'd be a good like a good patch. Um, if we can, I will I will PTU that thing for months. 4.0 better come out and be and be solid. That will be a game changer if it does. Um, as of right now, I, I don't think it's time yet. Um, I think Pez is going to cause a lot of issues that they need to iron out. I did Xeno Threat today, and um, I, you, you don't think about this type of stuff, but uh, some guy gets in his ship, the hangar doors open up, he runs into it, blows up. Okay, well, now his debris is there. Yeah. So now some guy gets up, and he runs into the debris, and there's more debris. And next thing you know, there's you can't get out of the hangar because it's too much debris in the way. Like we got to figure these things out. Um, you know, they, you guys probably saw the episode on live yesterday or the, yeah, yesterday. the day before, or whenever. Yeah, yeah. yesterday. Um, they need to figure out some way to kind of clean stuff up. I think that these dynamic events like Xeno Threat are really fun when they work smoothly, but adding Pez to Xeno Threat just shows how how crazy chaotic it could be when stuff isn't getting cleaned up um so they they, they need to iron some things out I, I i think this patch is going to be a while before things get ironed out but it is really cool though it's a huge step in the right direction um it's just some stuff needs to be ironed out yeah i think i think the the year for star citizens mass appeal will be the year that they finish the the kind of really solidify the new player experience which could be this year it could be later but the the problem right now is i know this really appeals to some people where cig star citizen just kind of spawns you into the game 
It's kind of like taking the keys and not like throwing you the keys. It's like throwing the keys at your face as hard as it possibly can to leave a mark on your face and then just flips you off and says, good luck and walks out the door. And you're just, you're just <laughs> stuck there. People like I know people who have taken days to figure out the F key gets you to you can get out of bed like because it's not obvious of how you how you do, you know, keys unless you go through all of the key bindings and try everything. Um, and then once you get out of bed, like, how do you, what do you do next? Where do you get your ship? Where do you do? There's no real like way of teaching people the game mechanics. And I know a lot of people are like, well, I love when, when a game doesn't baby me, but there's a difference between babying you when you are, you know, seven and babying you when you're a literal baby. And when, you know, new players come in, they are literal babies. They have no idea what anything does, let alone, and it's not intuitive at all. So there needs to be some of that hand holding at the very beginning. Then you yeah. can throw the keys at somebody and be like, good luck. But you well, need I think to it, have that a experience. big part of it, a big part of it is um, I'm OK with with joining a game and not knowing what I'm doing, mm -hmm. but I'm not as OK with joining a game and not knowing what I'm doing and having the game also actively fight me when I do things right. <laughs> yeah. Like if I figure out as a new player, if I figure out how to do a bunker mission and fly to it and land and I'm feeling pretty good about myself and then it sits on one out of 10 mm -hmm. and, and bugs out and I don't know why I failed the mission and now my rep is in the dumpster and I can't because in 318 your rep is getting hit again by yeah. bunker missions failing. So if, if that's happening to me, I start to get really frustrated really fast. My first half hour or my first couple of hours of gameplay, I'm thinking refund, you know, yeah. um, mm -hmm. because it's like not only do I have to learn this game. The, the game is going, when I do everything right, the game is going to hurt me for it. And I, I do, like that takes you out of the immersion so fast as a new player. And I think one of the biggest things a game should do is be able to grab a new player and pull them into the immersion, you know, mm -hmm. by, because they don't know what they're doing. You know, mm -hmm. the game is harsh. Like Tarkov is extremely harsh and it has its bugs, but you jump into the game and you get murdered by NPCs and players and whatever. But you understand that it's because you don't know what you're doing. And then yeah. when you start to learn what you're doing, you start to survive that better. And, you know, games being able to pull you into their immersion is incredibly important. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with that just in general. But I think that is really the key. Once CIG has a decent way where it doesn't just implement, say, this is how you play the game, but lets you go, so let's, let's them... It's kind of a moment where CIG can sit down with the player and go, this is the universe you're in. This is what we want you to learn about this universe. Have fun. That kind of introduction, that first few, this is what you're getting yourself into. Once you kind of understand that, you go, oh, I get this game now. You know, the, the, this, this, this makes sense now. I, I understand at least the beginnings of what this game wants me to do or what I can do. Um, and like a great example of this is Kleischer. I think as much as we give shit about Kleischer, that voice, that fucking voice that announcer i hope that guy's so a citizen smug. con so i can kick him in the nuts in real life. <laughs> he, he it's it's the perfect like he teaches you everything you need to know about kleischer in a couple of voiceover lines and it fits within the universe and if you even if you have no idea what's going on it'll walk you through that that process hello and welcome yes <laughs> I think they need to do. I I, I play um, um this mobile game Star Trek Fleet Command, yeah. and they added in a um like a new player thing where it's basically like a list of things that they ask you to do, and it teaches you how to play the game. Charkov actually has this up. The reason why my eyes look so red. Sorry, there's a mosquito hawk flying around here. Um, the reason why my eyes are so red is because I stayed up to like five a.m. playing Tarkov with my boys. I suck real bad, but um. But that game has, like, the gunsmith will give you quests to build guns. One of the most complicated things in the game is figuring out how to build a gun and tweak it with all these, with all the different mechanics that it has. And the gunsmith gives you a quest to build this gun. And each one gets progressively harder where you're adding four grips, you're changing out barrels, suppressors, stocks, and you get to get an idea of, like, um, what the changes you make to X affect the gameplay. Mm -hmm. And... I think that's really good. I think they just need to have a, uh, like a, a tutorial quest line yeah. that if you follow through it and you don't have to, but Optional. if you follow through it, it'll teach you how to get, I actually made a video, uh, from the Habs to the skies and I'm, I'm making this video and I'm reminiscing on what it was like when I first started playing. And it is really complicated to literally get from your Hab to the skies. 
And I had like 21 different tips that I could give someone on everything that they needed to do to get from waking up in bed to landing on a planet, doing a mission and all this type of stuff. And I think the game needs to do that. They shouldn't have to go to a YouTube video to find it. Yeah, and that's my point. I think that's when we'll start to see the the floodgates open. Once you have that moment of someone can can understand what's going on in the game around them and they 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 they're, they can they get to the point where the game can kick you in the nuts and then beat you in the face and then spit on you uh and so you can go oh wow yeah this game's tough you know yeah but it's fair but mm-hmm. it's yeah. fair yeah yes. like it's not like you know you've learned the game and then you know one out of ten left and you're screaming because the the, the turrets respawned and blew up your ship somehow you know th- not like that yeah uh, but to the point where you can overcome the challenge, where it feels like you accomplished something, which is a huge part of any game. So, mm-hmm. all right. Next question comes from Northern Trooper, and I'll start with you on this one, Zero. What made you start to stream Star Citizen? Oh, man. Uh, I have to give a little bit of a shout out and a little bit of credit uh, to my buddy, Citizen Sonoda. So uh, I kind of started streaming Star Citizen a little bit more. He he streamed it for quite a while. He's been at Tarkov and some other things too, but... Mm-hmm. Um, and I watched, you know, I just watched creators stream it and I was like, man, I love the idea of Star Citizen. I think it's kind of becoming this game space that I can kind of play, you know? Um, and this is like, I don't know, three, three years ago ish. Um, and, uh, that, that was the big decision for me, you know? Um, and then of course you, you meet the community and you meet such helpful people and such incredible people. Um, you know, pretty much everybody except Cupin. I'm just kidding, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> he's a mod in my chat so yes yeah. he's, he's, everyone but you yeah. no you, you meet the community and and you you have experiences um in star citizen that you just you play other games and you just don't have that same experience it's just not the same feeling um and uh and i think that's why you you, you start it you try it you meet the people you meet the game you get used to it and then you just can't you just can't quit you know so i think that's the yeah. really why Subliminal. Why? Why? What made you start to stream Star Citizen? Man, that, I'm gonna. Mine's nowhere near as good as that. Okay, so <laughs> um, I never really had an interest to go live, really at all. I didn't like the idea of it. Mm-hmm. It still makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Um, whenever I make videos where I have to talk to the camera, it's uncomfortable. But I could sit here and, and chat with you guys and talk, and it's fine. But um, I did it because I, I had a YouTube following and I wanted to interact with my audience. So. That, that's that's really that's what did it answer. for me. Yeah, uh, um, and and it's it's great. It's fun. Um, I'm I'm really glad I did it. Uh, I was watching. Um, I'm guessing maybe I don't know if this person is thinking about streaming or something themselves, but I was watching um, Harris Heller a lot for his uh, hardware reviews on products that kind of both leaned into content creation and streaming, and he's preaching to his like Twitch audience or like his. The people who wanted to be live streamers were saying, you guys got to make YouTube content. You got to make YouTube content. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like, well, well, crap, I'm already making YouTube content. Let's go live and see. And yeah, it was. I'm really glad I did. Um, I'm a little different because I've, I've been off and on streaming since like 2012. And I really got into streaming when KSP came out. And I first started streaming Corporal Space Program. Uh, KSP2 comes out in February, so I'm really excited about that. But um, I I backed Star Citizen, and I knew I wanted to stream Star Citizen because it was the game that I'd always wanted to see built. Not necessarily like the mechanics, but the concept of an open world space sim where it, it, it kind of simulates everything down to the basic life experience. Because I was a big fan of Daisy and... Uh, uh, those sorts of kind of survive rust, those sorts of survival experiences on top of uh, Kerbal Space Program. So the idea of having a more granular experience on top of this, you know, epic sweeping action moments was very natural to me. And putting it in space, which I love to do, love to to play around in anyways. And uh, so I started streaming Arena Commander. But the moment Arena Commander was able to be, I could play Arena Commander. I started to stream Arena Commander. And so that was 2015, I'm going to say 20, maybe 2016. And I've just been kind of doing that ever since. Uh, not nearly as good of a fighter pilot as it used to be, but, you know. Uh, all right. Next question comes from 
Yavin5, who asks, what do you think is the arena commander surprise that Jared said they, uh, t- uh, they got ready for us? I'm going to say something, and it's going to be controversial, and I don't think it's actually going to be shown off um, this week, but I do think it's going to happen this year, which is uh, Theaters of War. Oof. I that think is this, controversial. I think this year is the year of Theaters <laughs> of War. And the reason why I say it, and I've, I've been saying this recently, is because the Arena Commander team don't sleep on them. They've been, they've been around as an active team since February, and they have done a lot of work. I mean, you, I know you play a little bit of Arena Commander and Star Marine, right, Zero? Uh, yeah, sometimes. You, you know how different it is now compared to what it used to be and the, much of the huge, of the huge differences they've made. I'm just surprised um, they don't put AI in Star Marine. Like, yeah, just do it. So anybody can play Star Marine anytime and have something to shoot at it. And the AI is pretty good uh, when they're in a closed environment like that. So, oh yeah, yeah. why not? The AI is, is deadly on in all aspects. I think they dial it up. They have to dial it up because they know the server tick rate is going to be so low. Yeah, they have to make up like for the terrible server. So then when you get on a server where the, the server FPS is like 30, it's like you pop around the corner and some guy puts like nine bullets in your chest. And <laughs> yes. you're like, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But that's how they have to be to make the ser- the crappy servers yeah. not, you know, make any sense. I think that, something that, on, the, make any sense. on the more realistic side would be, and I hope they do this. Um, I've been asking for it since I've been doing racing. I want to see those racing tracks in Arena Commander. They're definitely. So that I can practice That'd there. Be cool. Okay, yeah. good. Because yeah. I want to be able to practice there because the travel time, um, when because you're when you're learning the track, if you're gonna push the, the ship to the limits, you're gonna be running into stuff all the time. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So I would like to not have to be able to spawn back at the station, wait for the claim time. I mean, I, I get it. It's Star Citizen, right? But how's that gonna work with Death of a Spaceman if you're yeah. a racing pilot who's running into things mm-hmm. every day? You know what I mean? Um, I, I just don't think people are gonna do it when that comes. So. I would like to be able to practice so I can at least ensure that I can get around the track without dying. Yeah. That'd be nice. Yeah. That or I mean, if you're going to be in the PU on these racetracks, like if you smash into something, it would be nice if your ship soft death instead yes. of hard death, mm-hmm. like immediately. Um, because it'd be cool to be alive after a crash. I mean, obviously if you <laughs> crash into an asteroid going, you know, four times the speed of sound, yeah, maybe you should blow up and die. But, mm-hmm. but you know, if you like clip something with your wing or clip something with your nose, like, oh, your ship goes into soft death and you just have to get saved now. You know, mm-hmm. and then you have people who are like hanging out at the racetracks being like, you know, scoop up medic people and bringing them back to the yeah. station. I think that's cool. The guys running with the fire extinguishers. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know, for me, uh, I would like to see an atmospheric arena command. I'm not saying I think we will, but I think it'd be very cool if we saw an arena commander module in atmosphere. Not just the racetracks, but um, like combat. Combat, like, yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. I, I know what, what they. The, okay. I I do know what they are going to show off though, because they've been talking about it in the monthly report. They're talking. They're going to. They've moved all of the. Or I think all of the racetracks into Arena Commander. They've completely redone the three tracks that were that are in, Re, in Arena Commander, and they've created a brand new map called Jericho Station for combat, which is just Jericho Station. And they're going to start doing that. We're going to pull parts of the universe just rip it from the PU and put it into the, into arena commander as like a battle map or as a, as a race map. Or oh, that's a great idea. Whatever. So, um, and, and to be clear, I know I'm insane saying theaters of war is coming in, but I say that because it gets people's attention. And I say arena commander team is going to be doing a lot of work this year simply because they, they have a mandate of go, they don't have the restrictions that all the rest of CIG does right now where they're waiting for this, that, or the other thing. And, the, you know, they don't have to worry about PES. They don't have to worry about server meshing. They just have to worry about their own content. And they've been really trying to dial in what it is that makes Arena Commander fun. So I'm looking forward to that. Also, this is a little off topic, I guess, but I think it'd be very cool if you did away. The plan eventually is to have a Star Marine Arena Commander be these uh, sim pods or whatever. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be cool if they got sim pods into the pu yeah uh and just bet it like you go to a sim pod at a station or whatever and that's how you play star marine and arena commander but of course that requires because there's times where you can't play the pu or for some reason you know but you can still play arena commander so i get it uh that it's maybe not ready for that but that would be very cool being able to do it in quantum if you have like a long quantum trip 
Maybe you have a sim pod in your ship. That'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, you get your your officers will go down to the mess and and hop onto some sim pods and and play arena commander while you're quantum traveling. Hmm. All right. Next question comes from the derpiest turtle who asks: Will procedural star systems be a possibility? They already are. Every system, or like like Stanton even, is procedurally generated. Okay, they, so there's two definitions of this that I've figured out. Yes. What he's talking about is like No Man's Sky type of thing, or yes. I think Elite Dangerous, where in like the the, the game itself makes random stuff up. Press go I, and it just goes. Yeah. And then yeah. that's the, the CIG starts on that, that, and then they go back and they craft everything. So like they don't physically craft all of the mountains of Lorville or of, uh, of, of uh, Hurston, but. Right they do hit generate and then they, they look at it and they go, Hmm, does that look right or wrong? And then they'll kind of tweak it here and there, or they'll, right. they'll dial in the, the, the seed or whatever it is and try to change it to make it look better. Um, their, but, their procedural is, is, is their tools. Their yes, tools tool. are procedural so that they can, um, just easily mass produce different things. That's why we'll see once they get done with a lot of the foundational stuff, the game's development should really ramp up as far as like making all these other systems is mm -hmm. once the 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 um, server meshing is is to the point where it can scale, then we could start to see a system every patch. It, it, yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's to change up the, these variable different aspects of a moon, and you could turn a moon from you know something that looks like Earth to something that looks like Luna, mm -hmm. lunar, whatever our moon's called. Um, yeah. So I think it's important for things if they are procedurally generated to be like gameplay and by that i mean mm. so in elite dangerous um they procedurally generate a lot of stuff but they have a stellar forge that is actually quite good and if you look at the galaxy map and you go okay there's a k class star over there there's a g class star over there so i know the k classes and the g classes have a goldilocks zone they have a chance at having water worlds or earth-like worlds mm. so i want to go there to that k class star that g class star whatever and i know that within you know what is it like 300 to like 700 light seconds away from the planet there could be an earth-like or a water planet i like that gameplay that adds depth to me you know depth, and that's exploration gameplay really dangerous kind of but mm -hmm. you can kind of look at something and infer what might be there because you know that the game the game's system makes sense you know um mm -hmm. and and if star citizen can get to that place then i'm cool with it um but if they don't get to that place where it's like they're just making stuff and, and you look at something and it doesn't make any sense why it is the way it is, like rivers running uphill all the time without a reason or something, like that doesn't make any sense. But on the other note, um, they actually do procedural, like Subliminal said, there's kind of two different procedurals. There's, there's high level procedural, which is like it makes the entire system and you just leave it be and it is what it is. Um, and then there's like curated procedural. So for instance, on, I think it's mm, Hurston, they used their river technology, the river tech tool, where they can now say, okay, there's a high spot on a mountain, and I click it, and then I say, make a river. And then it goes, and it makes a river. You know, that's a procedural river. It was procedurally generated by the river tech system, but it's still curated by CIG, so it's a unique and interesting place, um, or it should be a unique and interesting place. So hopefully they can do that with things like cities or settlements or bunkers where the, each one's different, caves, um, and all sorts of things like that without having to like, okay, I'll build a cave, you know, and, yeah. and it takes you like, you know, six months to build a moon or whatever. It needs to take them like six hours to build a moon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, because we did the math once and it's like, if they want to get 125 systems with conservative planet and moon numbers, conservative, like really yeah. low, it's going to take them like 11 years if they do one moon or planet every four days. Yeah. Those are the numbers that we ran and we were pretty in depth and pretty conservative about it. And so it's like, they're going to have to speed up. They're going to have to be able to make a moon in a day. Yeah. You know, um, it's just is what it is. And it's already, it's also already mapped up on the, you can go to the website, go to the apps or whatever, and go to star map. The yeah. whole system is already kind of mapped out. So I don't know where we would have these planets. It's like, oh, wow, look, I found this type of thing. And let's say broadened it to be like, okay, well, this is our galaxy. Maybe you could explore other way. Okay. Let's not get into that. We're, we're going down a rabbit hole. <laughs> Just Roberts uh, are here, and it'll add another ten years of development. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it is. It they do want to have some mysteries where you'll be able to find a jump point and find a new system, but that'll be a rare occasion. Yeah. Case it won't be. But I think the idea of the jump point is that they're not stable. They could go down and come back up. 
So that is, that makes sense. Yeah, to a degree. Like the, the if if it depends on the the we don't know a lot about the jump points right now because CIG keeps changing their mind on it. So you know we'll have to see. Um, but uh, in general, uh, what y'all said is right. I was going to add one more thing, which is uh, like the uh, Montreal team is working on a tool to procedurally generate crashes, derelicts. So that's what we kind of what we saw with ISC recently was a lot of that stuff is going to be used for the procedural generation where they can just push a button and a ship is spawned in an area and then they can go through and, and clean it up a little bit and add a little things there. Um, they talked about how there was a system they have currently that uh, it takes them about a week to do just the trails of a crash. So if they have a crash that happens, it takes a one designer a week to kind of fully kind of mesh it out and kind of make it look good. But with the tool that they've, they've designed, it takes less than a day to, 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 to do that one part. Yeah, and someday uh, making the trail of a, of a ship that's crashed needs to take like an hour. Yeah. Like that can't be a, a, that can't be a project anymore no. if the game is going to have 125 you know, plus systems. Like yeah. it can't be a project for some guy for a week or a day to you know, figure out what it looks like when a ship crashes on a planet. Like you got to yeah. tell something, you got to teach something how to make that happen. You or know? it just happens on its own. You just, you just, you don't even have to have someone right. doing it. It just does it yeah. procedurally. Somebody but. mentioned this in chat, but um, the river thing that you guys are just talking about, they're going to use that same technology for roads mm -hmm. and lava flows. So, flows. Yeah. And yeah. And lava flow. Yep. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, we've, we're kind of coming up on the, the kind of, upper end of this of, of our time here so i'm going to go through and kind of uh kill some of this stuff uh or we can go a little bit faster too with some some of our, our questions um i'm gonna that this question doesn't make any sense i'm gonna remove that one uh next question comes from the wowser who asks when do you think we will get ammo types i haven't heard anything about that in a while we probably need more damage in general, like the new damage system. Yeah, I gotta be honest. At this point, it's like, it's frustrating to use the same kind of weapons and to not have much variation uh, for the most part, but uh, we just gotta see what they do with armor. Like, you gotta they, start somewhere. You gotta start at the have, ground. <laughs> they have mentioned it. They mentioned, like, um, different projectile types. Uh, yeah. Like plasma or something that could, like, melt the hull or something. There's some stuff that they're actively working on right now for that. Yeah, I can't remember exactly what it was. It's almost I think it was plasma. Though. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. like plasma for like like an armor piercing round versus like a kinetic round versus a or versus a, like a like a like a or thermal something, round. Something that yeah. would burn or do bio damage. Caust I think it was yeah. caustic. Is the word caustic. you're looking for? Yeah. yeah, the caustic rounds. I also think that those are again squadron. So it really it really yeah. depends on when we get our damage the damage system in. Which again, yes, I mean squadron forty two is going to be heavy on on. Uh, like ship com on combat gameplay. Yeah. So pretty much everything combat related, combat balance related, we're going to see the basis for that in Squadron 42, and then they're going to have to tweak it for a player versus player environment. Uh, all right. Next question comes from Velociraptor, who says, do you think 318 being in wave one for so long dissuades or tempers any excitement uh, for the wave? I guess for like the future waves. I've been I've been warning about this for at least a year now. Like um making these type of back end changes, it's gonna get worse before it get and, and what it is it is worse, but fortunately enough for everybody, it's it's worse just in the P, the PTU for the people who have access to it. Mm. It's like this stuff is like really complicated. It's not gonna be as easy as adding in a ship or a gameplay mechanic. This stuff runs in the background and it touches on everything. And um, I just don't see it. It's going to take a while to get it dialed in, I think. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, and it's it's partially up to the community to not burn themselves out on PTU content. Um, it's nice to get a taste of a patch, uh, you know, but it's it's a special kind of person who can log in every day and play a different version of this of the same broken PTU patch, yeah. Uh, especially the early ones. So it's like, you know, if you're like a, a wave two player or like an open uh, PTU player, and that's the kind of experience that you're used to, 
I, you know, I mean, you can dip into the P, like the early the wave one PTU stuff, but you're probably going to be frustrated by it. It's a frustrating mm -hmm. experience and it takes a lot of willpower not to just absolutely rage some days because of how frustrating it is. And on that note, if you're in wave one and you're not using the issue council or at least looking at it or contributing to anything, you know, you'd be fine as a wave two player, to be honest with you, because you're, you you kind of want to play it. You want to enjoy it. You want to see it. Whereas the wave one players, I think a lot of them, yeah, you want to see it. Yeah, you want to play it. But you got to have like you got to have some semblance of knowledge of the issue council, I think. Um, you know, in my opinion, I always push people like go to the issue council, go to the issue council, at least look for issue council reports that are like, oh, I've had that happen and then contribute to it. It takes like two seconds. You know, you don't have to make issue council reports every day. But yeah. Uh, all right. Next question comes from anonymous bystander one who asks, should thrusters be additive in accelerated or acceleration strength? It's not intuitive and feels like it should always be moving at 45 degree uh, diagonals to get the fastest turn rate. Uh, should this flight model mechanic stay? That's I think I know what, what you're mean. talking about. You're talking about pitch yaw. They're talking about pitch yaw, right? Mm -hmm. I think so. I thought yeah, I've yeah. always found it. I mean, it, it's a video game, so they can do whatever they want, but, yeah. um, I've always found it a little bit weird that if you pitch, it's a certain speed, and if you yaw, it's a certain speed, and if you pitch and yaw, for some reason, it's faster. And people are going to say, well, that's because it engages more maneuvering thrusters. Well, that doesn't change the top speed of those maneuvering thrusters, like the top speed they can push your ship in a direction. So from my logical brain, I go, well, I don't think adding, like pitching and yawing at the same time should be faster than pitching alone or yawing alone depending on your environment, obviously atmosphere might be different, but um, when you're in space and there's nothing resisting the top speed of your maneuvering, thr your pitch thruster or your yaw thruster, then I think that pitching and yawing should be able to reach the same top speed as pitching and yawing together. You know, pitch or yaw should be able to reach the same top speed as pitching and yawing at the same time, which is that 45 degree angle um, thing that they're talking about. But I think that if you engage more maneuvering thrusters like pitch and yaw thrusters, you should be able to reach that top speed faster, if that makes sense. So, yeah. I don't know. I mean, they're going to do what they're going to do. So, what do you think, Subliminal? Should you always, should they always have this ability where you, if you're moving diagonally, you're moving faster rather than just up, down, left, or right? Oh, is that what they're talking about? I yeah. thought they were talking about like maybe having the rear thrusters be able to angle in a certain direction to help you turn faster. No, they're saying that it's currently it's additive in acceleration strength. So basically, oh, so like, like if you're so, pitching and yawing at the same time, you make a full revolution, like. 20% faster than, than if you're just pitching. still and yeah. pitching and it's weird. I don't really have much of an opinion on it because I didn't really notice. I've never played a flight sim or a space sim or anything before this. So this is all I know. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't I didn't really uh, even think of that that would even be something that I, I yeah, I just didn't even notice that, that was a thing. Yeah, maybe it's not a huge deal. I mean, it, like at the end of the day, it's just a game mechanic. So it's a matter of learning how to get different game mechanics work on one side. Like mm -hmm. It's fine, I guess. But, but I, from I, from a, like a like a how stuff works aspect, my brain kind of goes, well, that shouldn't really be that way. But then again, there's a crab ship made by tree people that bleeds. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. know, whatever. Um, but I I always thought that the thrusters actually did something, like like the way your ship moves the way it does because the thrusters are actually moving you in that direction. They are. So if if what if it's possible that moving in that direction, what if that makes sense? It, I mean, you it, know what I mean? It does in the sense that like the, because they're all firing at the same time, you're getting more thrust to that direction because you can fire more of those. Mm -hmm. they're, they're yeah, and more I could see the stuff. pitch and yaw acceleration being faster because of that, but the top speed of pitch and yaw. Yeah. Like, oh, you know, I get weird, what you're saying. You know? Yeah, that is weird. You, you're moving faster going like this than going like this or going like yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. It's a little you're, bit of a moot point, but eh, you know, whatever. Um, I don't know. All right, all right. Next question comes from Gingerbomb, who asks, "What responsibility do you think each uh, each have, or you each have, as content creators slash streamers of the game to direct support to the game?" Uh, I'm gonna be honest. Uh, at the end of the day, we are not employed by CIG. We are not. Uh, they're they're not paying us. We're doing this as fans. For fun, even if we do this as a career, I, 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 no, I don't. I, I know zero works. And I, I, subliminal is this what your your job, or do you, you have another yeah, full job? time, content full time, creator, yeah. So, as a result, 
I most of, personally, I don't think any of us have a responsibility to CIG or to the community. Now, that being said, I do think that we have a power to deal to, to do stuff to the community, um, which is outsized at times. Like because we have a megaphone that we can and, and an audience, we can promote them some ideas that 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 we that we like. But if the question is, do we have a responsibility to the game? I don't No. No, no, we don't. I think at the end of the day, we're just we're just content creators in our, in our, of ourselves. And and if you if if someone say like cause I I know at least I do, and I know plenty of you you, you probably all you all probably have to you have people who just do not like you. Who who don't want to who who don't dislike what you do or bother you or or, or make bad comments in videos or show up at streams try to troll all that kind of stuff, like like we're not going to appease everyone. So it's harder for us to say like we have a responsibility around uh, supporting the game is is a little because we're not going to appeal to every single individual. Uh, so they don't necessarily listen to us. What do you think, Supplemental? Do you think we have a uh, we have do we have a responsibility to direct support to the game? Um, to oh to direct support to the game? Yes. I think we have a responsibility to set expectations for the game. Yes. People come into our streams all the time and ask us, "Hey, should I check out this game?" And the first, I just immediately hit them with negative, like yeah. this isn't a game, really. You know, it's being built, so you have to understand. And when that happens, it doesn't necessarily discourage someone because they're watching me play. They're seeing that we're having fun. They're seeing mm -hmm. us play. But it sets the expectation that, like, I think for most people, this may not be a game to main unless yeah. you're making your own content. You're spending every day playing this game by yourself, doing whatever it has to offer. You're not making your own gameplay. It's... It's it's not it's just something you should probably come back every patch and check it out. Um, so I do think we have the obligation to set an expectation to people so that they don't just like see us play, right? Because you know when we play, there's a a hundred things that we do to like bypass bugs, like that we don't even think about. Yeah. And when a new player gets in, they're not going to have the same experience as us. Even if they literally try to do what we did, they don't even understand the things that just were running in our back, the back of our head, like not being too close to the edge of a ship because you might get sucked out into the, into the vacuum. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it, it's it's going to be a, a like a rough experience until you understand how to work around the bugs. But it's definitely worth the 45 bucks. Like, mm. What? Um, it, it's, and it's, it's worth more than that. I, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a great game. I have a lot of fun. I recommend everybody should play it, but if you're going to come into the aspect of this and comparing it to other complete games, then you're going to have a bad experience. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, Joe? I think you... I'm there too. So I find as a, like, if you're a content creator, I think, uh, your, your main responsibility is to not like the community the people that come in and watch the people yeah. that come in and hang out I say your and, and your community the people yeah. that you that if they dm you you know like you'll be interested you'll, you'll 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 respond you'll you'll you want to respond you want to engage with those people so i think we that's the number one um i think responsibility um so when it comes to star citizen like subliminal kind of said when people come in to ask like hey should i you know i'm thinking about this game should i check it out you know it's very important what you say, like if you're a content creator or if you're somebody who has a lot of like a lot of sway with that person who's asking, they want your opinion because they know that you play a lot. And if you say, yes, it's the best thing ever, like they're probably going to hit the buy button, you know, and you have to understand that what you say may help them make a more. They're asking you for an for information to make an informed decision. And so usually what you, you know what I'll say is something like, look. If you have a powerful PC and you're okay with some pretty high level bugs from time to time, like if you can handle those two things, then I think the game can give you $45 worth of enjoyment. That's what I usually say. And then mm -hmm. I say, but it's under development. There are going to be times where it's way worse, you know, than it is better. And there's going to be times where it's better than it is worse. And it's not going to be this game two years from now, you know? So you have to understand that it's not going to be what you're seeing right now all the time. And your, your mileage may, may vary based upon a lot of things like hardware 
um, you know, the other software you have running, the things you choose to do in game, the things that you like to do in game. Um, and uh, you just have to give them, it feels like you have to give somebody a full picture, you know, yeah. to be like, you're responsible to give somebody a full picture of what the game is before you tell them blindly to support the, the, the game or not, you know? Okay. In that context, I agree with that because uh, it's not something I do, but I, I, I didn't know if it was responding to saying like, we're responsible to ensure that support comes to the game because oh like, no screw that no yeah no <laughs> that's, that's not on me that's cig's job you answered CIG's that job yeah. Is to, yeah cig's job is to market their game and hopefully market it uh ethically yeah. um um looking at you cutlass steel um, <laughs> spelled s-t-e-a-l yeah but uh so it's it's on them to to market the game in an ethical way um and to build the game you know that yeah. uh, that they're marketing, you know, but I, but I agree that that like it's something I do all the time. Whenever someone comes in into my stream and says, "Should I buy Star Citizen?" my my answer is no, because whenever <laughs> someone comes in and asks that question, it's like no, you, I I know why you came in and asked that question. You came in and asked that question because you're like, "Should I? Play, is this Tarkov? Is this WoW? Is this you know Space Engineers? Can I? Should I just just is this the game I should be putting my time and money into?" And my response is always no, because if you're coming with that expectation, you, you're, it's a terrible game. Like you're you're going to fall through the elevator once and then you're going to be like, nope, I'm done. Yep. And, and that yep. doesn't help you. It doesn't help the person out who's interested in the game. It doesn't help out the community. It doesn't help out the the like the game grow in terms of monetary, uh, you know, like the like getting more money because those people will then just rage quit and then believe everything that everyone says about Star Citizen being a scam because they just had a bad experience yep. because CIG is bad at doing the new player experience right now. And maybe like, never even come back. Yeah. But if you give them the expectation like, hey, like. Don't main it. But come back every yeah. patch and check out and see what kind yeah. of new things are added in. Try, I always say try out the, the free fly if you see if it's good for you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and like, they, like if Star Citizen ever came out and they were like, look, guys, uh, you know, try our game out. It's great for new players. Like that would be just a lie. Yeah. Like that would be just a straight yeah. up lie. I would rail against them everywhere I could. Twitter, yeah. Discord, Twitch, YouTube. I'd make a YouTube video about it. I've made a YouTube video in, a in like a month. Yeah. <laughs> It would be it would be a travesty if they did something like that. So at the very least, they're not doing things like that. Yeah. But it's that's why I say like it's imp it's important for a developer who's making a game like this to have some kind of ethics in the way that they are presenting the game, the way that they are you know disclaiming the game. And I think that that kind of falls on myself a little bit too. Like yeah, I want to tell people that I have fun in Star Citizen because I do. But I also feel like I have to finish that sentence with but it's going to piss you off sometimes. <laughs> you know, and I, here's why. As I always like to say, sometimes you play Star Citizen and sometimes Star Citizen plays you. Yes, it's exactly. Just, there are days that happens and you're just yeah. like, all right, it's day, day C, Star Citizen doesn't want me to play. Uh, all right, next question comes from Expat Brat, who asks, do you think that limited edition ships, skins, and variants will, or will be earnable in-game on release? What info do you have to support your argument? Ooh. Expat Brat always being very thorough. By the way, Expat Brat, fantastic streamer. Fantastic streamer. Perfect. Oh my gosh, it's fun to watch. I've been um, talking to her. She, she's coming on to the captain's table in March with uh, Zerk, Zer, uh, Zark Media. So we're going to sit down and talk with, uh, talk with them. But they're both in, in the, 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 the deep tart time zones where it's going to be like 2 a.m. for both of them. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, um, go ahead. Yeah, I mean... Well, <sighs> I've lost, I've lost the question now talking about expat Brett. Uh, oh I my God, me it. too. Uh, it's, you. it's, do you think that limited edition ships, skins and brands oh, oh, will yeah, be earnable? Yeah, I got it back. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hope so. Uh, I hope that there's things you can do. we talked about this earlier, I think uh, in the last segment, I hope that there's things you can do in game and places you can go like the races, you know, mm -hmm. like you get a platinum finish on all the races and you get something special. You know, you go to some kiosk and you know, you turn in your times, you know, some racing kiosk or whatever. And they're like, Cool, man. Here's your, you know, special, you know, Technicolor dream paint for your race razor, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I just, I, I love the idea of that. I love, I love the more, the more things that are earnable in game. I think the more that players stay in game, engaged in game, and striving for new things in game. So I absolutely hope that there's exclusive stuff that is based upon things like reputation, mission chains, achievements that are in game. Not necessarily like Xbox achievements, but like I did a thing in game 
and mm -hmm. I got a tangible reward for it. A good example is if you go to in 317, if you go to the Hurston security bunker, sometimes you will find a safe in there that you can open up and there's this little special badge in there that you get yeah. to keep. And it means nothing except every time anybody ever gets it, they're like, that's the coolest thing ever. And it essentially means nothing, but you get it and you love it. And uh, you did a thing to, you went to a place to go get it. And that's very special, I think. Uh, I think X-Packs also talk about like the limited edition ships you can get right now. Ah, that's a tough one because yeah. that's a tough one for me. That, that is a little bit tougher because it does feel like, you know, you were a part, you were a backer of the game at this point. That's been a thing that's been forever, right? Like, uh, what is it? Um, oh, uh, Warframe. Mm -hmm. So I backed Warframe in, in like Kickstarter or whatever. Um, and I got access to a Warframe that you can never get access to again, ever. The, it, it won't be in game and you can't earn it in game and you can't earn it. You can't pay, um, you know, the Warframe money to get it. Um, but I have it and it's cool that I have it because I kickstarted the game early. So I don't see a big problem with earlier backers having some access to some special things because they were earlier backers because that's been a thing in gaming for ever, you know, or for a long time, yeah. ever since, you know, crowd crowdfunding was a thing. I don't really see a problem with that. Um, but I do think that some things could come back, you know, the ability to earn, you know, the CDF stuff, you know, like, yeah, that was kind of an early in development thing, but I don't see a problem with like being able to earn access to CDF armor through some set of circumstances in the game when it goes live either. I think that will be fine, but I want there to be some sort of a, a different, something different about it. Like if they're gonna bring back that CDF armor for another one, change the color up a little bit. Change like uh, the, you can the, get a the core armor part of it. Like the go from yeah. whatever it's modeled after, whatever normal armor it's modeled after, change it to a different one, so that you can look at it and say, "Oh, that's a 2019 uh, CDF one." Blah blah blah. So that that the the people who got it early can still say, "I got this thing that very few people have," but then the the newer people can still get it. It just won't be the exact same thing. Yeah, like a first edition holographic Charizard versus a, seriously, versus a base set holographic Charizard. Mm -hmm. Like, they're both special, you know, they're both unique, mm -hmm. but there's, the first edition is, is a little different, you know? Yeah. What do you guys think about, like, the Saber? You guys think the Saber will ever be the Raven? viable? Oh, the or Raven? The Raven, that's what I mean, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the Saber I feel Raven? like there might be... I don't know, maybe not, but I was going to say, I feel like there might be legal issues if they do. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have no I, idea. I, I think there's a, there's, there, it's, it's a depends answer. Um, like, 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 like old, old people underwear. It depends. Um, there's some of the things will be on CSG is like lockdown. No, like you're not going to be able to access it. But for instance, like Vanduul sites, which are really limited and right now, you can just disable a Vanduul ship and take the scythe. Like that will be available in game. You just have to do it in game. There'll be ways that you can achieve some of these limited things. Like, oh yeah, there's limited numbers of addresses, but the limited numbers of addresses you can purchase, you can still purchase them in game or you can just steal one, but there, there'll, there'll be ways you can acquire some of those things, but things like the, the, the IAE best in show stuff. No, they'll probably not. The, like that that stuff is, is almost certainly only for yeah. that event because they want to participate have people participate in those things kind of like the the cdf armor that i have yes will there be, probably be more cdf armor for certain you almost certainly will be able to earn it um outside of just that that event but that uh, you could only earn it in that event so you can you know with the the iae they're only unique to those specific times those specific those specific uh uh, moments now do you think you get something similar i think as you said like the the first edition shiny Char charizard versus the holographic uh, Char Char standard Char charizard yeah almost certainly you can get a paint scheme that's almost similar to the, the paint scheme that you could have at uh, iae but it won't have the, the livery it won't have all of the other fancy stuff attached to it kind of a, a downgrade one side note i really do hope that they take some of those special edition ships and just make them skins the ones mm -hmm. that are literally just skins they really need to go through and just make those skins give everybody their skin and 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 remove this like duplicate ship that you have to have like you know what i mean yeah yeah and i, I get it. i know why you were asking you asked right you said uh, chris roberts said everything would be available in game at the start so that's why i asked yes well the thing i don't think skins necessarily are going to be as um 
kind of included in that. I think all of the ships will be able, though we don't know the legal issues behind the Omega and the 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 Raven because those are the two yeah. ships that were sold in conjunction with other companies. So it's hard to tell if those will also be available. But yeah, all of the ships that are in game now will be available to purchase in game, or all the ships the ships that will be available will be able to purchase or earn in game. Uh, I think oh, it's interesting. Uh, I think it's interesting to note that if you want an Anvil Valkyrie Liberator after the game goes live, you find somebody with one and yeah. you steal it, and then yeah. you have one. Technically, it's earnable. <laughs> Technically, it's earnable. Oh, that might the be the way around person, it. I gotta you know? be honest. <laughs> uh, all right, last two questions and we're done. Um, DDOT Gamer asks, "Do you think turrets need to uh, need to me or need to be adjusted on bigger ships to help gunners stay on light fighters better?" Did you say that one more time. Do you think turrets need to be adjusted on bigger ships to help gunners stay on light fighters better? I'm going to say right now, no, but in the future, so right now the way turrets work is there's this like eight degree radius circle that if you have a ship in that circle, like the pip of a ship in that circle, it's auto aim. And it's not like auto gimbals where it like slowly tracks the target. It's snaps to that target. So there's like this big giant circle where if you aim that giant circle at like near the pip of a ship, you're on target. So that makes it pretty easy to stay on target uh, in turrets for the most part. Um, another big thing is like learning how to use like the uh, the gyro mode and things like that. Um, so right now I don't think so, but if they tweak the auto aim stuff, if they tweak some other things about turrets, yeah, maybe they'll, they'll probably have to tweak turret speed. Um, I think CIG does plan in the future to have a system where if you downsize the weapon sizes on turrets or on gimbals, they will be behave better. Um, they'll be able to move faster and things like that due to like weapon weight or whatever is the plan. So that might be a mechanic that comes through and then allows them to tweak the speeds and have the, the person who fit the ship up tweak the speeds and like, okay, this hammerhead can track light fighters way, way, way better because it's all, all of its turrets are sized down to size three or whatever. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it won't be as effective as a, 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 like team shooting in Idris to take it down. That makes yeah. sense. And fighter, and yeah, cow tipper is right too. Um, SCM speed is about to, well, not about to, but master modes probably mm -hmm. will require a turret. I don't know if turret overhaul is the right word, but some changes to turrets, especially that auto aim part, because mm -hmm. Fighters are going to be moving a lot slower. Yeah. They'll still be maneuverable, but yeah, the the maximum speed it's going to be hard to like whip past a hammerhead, you know, going mock Jesus or whatever. Yeah. Um. All right. Last question is from anonymous bystander who asks: Should CIG increase multi-crew ship HP pools to increase in survivability and enable better large ship battles? Personally, I think I would say yes. But mostly, it's just me. Go ahead, armor so is going to fix all that. It will, the bigger eventually. ships are going to have armor. And to yeah. my knowledge, the, uh, one of the aspects of that is that like certain size weapons won't be able to penetrate the armor. Mm -hmm. So you could roll up in your Aurora and shoot at a hammerhead all day, and you're never going to penetrate the hull. You might be able to take the shields down, but you're never going to penetrate the hull, which means you can't do any damage to it. They can turn the shields off and just sit there. Um, so I think that's... It, it when once we get armor and that's like the i think like the final defensive thing that we need once we get armor then we can start balancing everything but until we figure out how that's going to work a lot of the stuff is going to get balanced and it's just going to have to get rebalanced well here's the thing health pools are going away we're not going to have health right. pools forever they're exactly. going to move move to a more component damage system so yep. once that happens that's when they're going to have to going to worry on work on balance Personally, I think it, it's, if it's just change number value to increase toughness to make it more fun in the short term, go for it. Like, I'm okay with that because that's just a, punching a number into a, into a spreadsheet. Well, and the um, other thing is there's so many ships that like the 600i has been, this has been a problem for a long time. The 600i's, and this is uh, pre-317.4, I think, but yeah. I don't remember when they changed it. But the, the 600i could be killed by an Inferno in like, five seconds it was insane and it's been mm. insane for a long time now they're reworking the 600 i but whatever i think there's a lot of big ships that kind of had that issue where it's like man that probably should have lived longer mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? 
And so, yeah, and if it's just an HP value, like they've made some tweaks, like they tweaked the Blades HP a couple of times, the Gladius is HP a couple of times, the Arrows HP a couple of times to account for the one shield generator. They tweaked the Constellations HP like in four different patches uh, with the the engine nacelles and stuff like that and the, the main body hull. So like they want ships to feel right. But I feel like there's a lot of places where that that could be done a little bit better. Yeah. Even even now, not just in the future with armor and stuff. But yeah, armor is going to create this whole new system where they have to go, okay, so this ship has this much base reduction. How long should it last against a bunch of size one weapons, you know, or whatever? They're yeah. going to have to figure that out. Um, yeah, that's one of those things I've been saying, like, ships are only about 50% done. No ship is complete yet because there's so many new things that they have to add between now and, uh, you know, even Squadron 42 releasing that they're going to, like, top down have to do a complete refit of all of the ships. And I know it keeps John Crew up at night. <laughs> you can see it in his eyes whenever he talks about it. There's two uh, things that keep John Crew up at night is that and Project Twingo. For those of you yes. who are on Twitter. Twingo is his... <laughs> I would say th the third thing is the endeavor. If you, if you tell him the endeavor, he he shouts and screams and and curses into the night because the endeavor is impossible. But yes, go check out John's Project Twingo. It's actually a um, it's on YouTube too. He has he posts his video on it too. So uh, yeah, well, thank you so much, um, Supplemental and Zero State for joining us for this this Captain's Table. If you did enjoy this, make sure that you are subscribed and following both of these wonderful content creators on Twitch and YouTube. Uh, and if you enjoyed this, if you're watching this after the fact. Make sure you come join us live at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, where we cover this topics like this with a variety of different content creators. Uh, well, you know, go, going forward, we have, I think I have everything booked up until like March in terms of content creators, finally. So it feels nice to have that. Um, and of course, I want to hear your thoughts on any of the questions we answered and also your own questions in the comments down below. Make sure you leave a like button if you if you enjoyed this. That really does help with the promotion because YouTube says, oh, this person enjoyed it so much they hit the like button. They did a little extra step. Um, and if you disliked it, hit the little down, the, 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 the dislike. Uh, that also tell YouTube to, to stop recommending videos that you don't like to yourself. <laughs> and like I say every time, hope to see you someday in the black. <laughs>